Um, Tushar, long time, uh, part of the long time stronghold of philosophy of physics in the UK. We're very happy to have him here, although he's going down under. Uh, he's been a fellow of the British Academy uh, at the University of Cambridge and is now um, moving to Melbourne, aren't you? Right. Yeah. Uh, what's the name of the university again? Uh, so the Dianoia Institute at uh, the Australian Catholic University. Right. The Australian Catholic University. So, uh, but of course, there's this long, close connection between UK and Australian philosophy physics. Yeah. Indeed. Very glad to have you keeping it up. <laughs> and uh, he's speaking to us today about uh, inferential scientific realism. Thanks so much, Tushar. Take it away. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's lovely to finally be here speaking at the Sigma Club. Thank you all for coming. Um, just a quick admin thing before I get into the talk, so you can see two QR codes over here. I don't usually have a handout for my talks, but I thought today, because I'll be talking about some slightly non-standard philosophy of language stuff, um, it might be useful to just have some of that uh, at, your, at your fingertips. Um, so that, yeah, so there's a URL for that, and also if you're just interested in, in having a look at the slides uh, at some point, um, you can do that. All right, so much by way of uh, boring admin stuff, let's go. So I want to be a scientific realist. I think that's a fairly um, uncontroversial um, sort of position to hold. Some of you in this room, some of you uh, online would like to be as well. And uh, I was reflecting a little bit, uh, you know, in, in one of my in one of my most sedate reflective moments, was reflecting on why it is that I have this impulse. And of course, as, as, a, as a piece of pure biography, it's because I'm a philosopher of physics, and one of the things that doing philosophy of physics in this part of the country sort of inculcates in you is the view that you should just, you know, you should take physicists seriously you know, they're about various things that they say, you know, not unquestioningly, but certainly seriously. And so, um, uh, you must just click on the, here, I'll help you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, just click on the screen and then there that's All right. right. And so, um, here's a nebulous idea of, of, of what I take to be the impulse that I, that I have about scientific realism, about my, my position as a scientific realist is I should take scientists, um, and for the rest of this talk, when I say scientists, I will mean physicists for no other reason than that's the bit of science that I know the best. Uh, and also, I think for various reasons, will be the most germane to the sorts of things that I want to say today. But yes, the scientific realist impulse, as I, as I think about it, is something like, you know, take physicists seriously about what they say about what the world is like. Um, in particular, about what the world is like uh, in what you might call the poorly accessible bits of the world, right? The, perceptually poorly accessible bits of the world. And this usually proceeds by some kind of extrapolation, right? If you want to formalize this, this usually gets, you know, the arguments are usually things like no miracles or, or, or the like, but it's really just an extrapolation from the success of science in one domain to some other domain where the basic idea is, well, why would it fail, right? And of course, the answer is there are various reasons why it might fail. Um, but what I want to do today is I want to determine what sort of philosophical apparatus, what sort of new and interesting philosophical apparatus I can bring to bear in this discussion in order to take this sort of suggestive, but I think pretty uh, compelling norm, uh, compelling impulse, and turn it into a well-articulated norm. Now, of course, I'm not the first person to do that. It feels weird to stand in the LSC and say, you know, no one's tried this before. That's obviously not the case. But I suspect no one's really tried it in exactly the way that I'm that I'm going to suggest today. So that's what I'm going to. That's the that's the sort of broad view of what's going to happen today. And I think a good place to start is this line from from Arthur Fine's uh, Natural Ontological Attitude paper, because I think he captures um, an important moving part in this in this impulse. Right. So he says it is possible to accept the evidence of one's senses and to accept in the same way the confirmed results of science only for a realist. And there are two different ways of understanding realists there, right? There's the realist about the stuff for which one senses as evidence, and then there's a realist about things in science. And so the thing that's doing a bunch of work over here is this in the same way locution, right? Because the, the in the same way locution is going to distinguish, uh, say, a semantic instrumentalist like a logical empiricist, right, who still want to assent to claims like electrons are negatively charged from a bona fide scientific realist who, who, who thinks there's much more uh, to, to the truth of electrons are negatively charged than what someone like a logical empiricist is going to want to, uh, is going to, want to accept. So I think this is a good place, for me anyway, this is a good place to start to try to spell out the norm that I'm, that I'm interested in. So if we're interested in understanding in the same way, well, what is that way? Oh, sorry, I think. Uh, I right, right, there you go. That's fine. Yeah, there we go. So, so what is that way? Well, the way is uh, think about the sorts of everyday knowledge claims about which we 
it's more or less unproblematically be what you might call an external realist or a metaphysical realist, right? And so our, our, most of our everyday knowledge um, is in the form of ascriptions of properties or relations to objects, right? I know this table is hard. It has the property of being hard or rigid or solid. And I test it in various ways, right? I knock it. I sort of have a look at, you know, I don't actually know how to test how any, um, but it's, you know, I, there are various properties that I can ascribe to this table on the basis of my sort of perceptual interaction with it. And so the question is, well, what, is, what are the descriptive resources we use in order to make these sorts of everyday knowledge claims? And that's the stuff that we're taught in, you know, as first year, uh, as first year philosophy students, right? It's the semantic apparatus of something like Tarskian model theory or generalizations thereof. And the associated machinery that you're going to use is the machinery of things like denotation or reference, satisfaction, truth, various things like that, in order to understand how um, basically how, how these different sorts of everyday knowledge claims can, can interact, right? Can be uh, can be concatenated and various sorts of things. And so if the idea is we should do a similar thing with science, presumably the idea is something like we use these model theoretic resources, but instead of quantifying over tables and chairs and, and, and you know, projectors, we quantify over the objects that science tells us to quantify over, and we ascribe to them the properties that science tells us to ascribe to them, right? So rather than just using my senses as evidence for what the properties should be, I'm using science as evidence for uh, what the properties should be. And so in this view of science, science is basically you know, a real refinement, a systematization or a refinement of our everyday modes of inquiry. Now that refinement can be extreme, right? I, you know, to trace the path between, you know, knocking this table and building a large hadron collider is, you know, you know, there are miles between those two. But this view doesn't really care about the methods of inquiry. It cares more about the descriptive tools, right? The idea is whatever you're doing to figure out these objects and properties, the descriptive tools are going to be the same. They're going to be the tools of just ordinary sort of task in semantic, uh, task in model theory. And so the question is. Okay, given this, what is the view of realism about everyday objects that proceeds using, using this machinery, right? How do we characterize realism about tables and chairs and the like? And I'm going to suggest something that might initially seem a bit roundabout, but it'll become clear pretty soon why I, why I plumped for this as a, as a sort of necessary, uh, and I argue later sufficient condition for, for, for being a realist. So the idea is X is a realist about some objects or about some uh, kind of discourse, only if they can attribute either to themselves in some way through some locution or to someone else a Dirac attitude regarding the objects about which they're supposed to be realists, right? And I think that while this might not be a, a characterization of realism, I think this is a lot of thing. Uh, this is a thing that a lot of realists will eventually think of as a consequence of their view of realism, right? I, you know, I imagine uh, the person who accepts someone like Van Frassen's characterization of the scientific realist will want to say yes. Among other things, the scientific realist will attribute um, uh, the, the scientific realist will attribute to some to 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 their interlocutors particular Dirac attitude. By Dirac attitude, I just mean an attitude about some object, something that's out there in the world. This is often contrasted. I mean, there are various ways in which you can draw the Dirac Victor distinction, but this is contrasted with claims uh, that are supposed to pick out uh, descriptions or sort of linguistic um, sort of ways of talking about things rather than actual objects. Um, and so, yeah, so my claim is um, that to understand realism is to understand the manner in which one can make a Dirac description. And I'll say a lot more about this in, in, in what follows. One thing that this model theoretic way of understanding realism and understanding um, sort of these Dirac descriptions kind of smooshes together is the fact that there are actually two aspects to what I, what I call semantic coordination that need to be prized apart. Um, the first is what I call the interpersonal aspect of coordination, just interpersonal coordination, right? I'm having a conversation with Brian, I say something about the Statue of Liberty, Brian says something else about the Statue of Liberty. Well, we need to ensure that we're both talking about the same thing, right? We need to establish what, what, what Lewis sometimes called semantic glue, right? Between our words and stuff that's out there in the world. But even before we do that, we need to make sure that however we're establishing that glue separately, when we're talking to each other, in a sense, our two locutions are glued, right? We first glue our, our two locutions onto each other, and then we can ask the question of what stuff in the world those two glued things are themselves gluing onto. I'm going to stop talking about glue in a minute, right? But that's the second, that's the second aspect of the, of the coordination, right? The world-to-world -world coordination, right? That's just a single person thing. When I say Statue of Liberty, 
um, what is it that allows me to say that I'm picking out this thing that I intend to pick out, right? And these, th these two things are both important co uh, components of a realist position, right? If I want to be a realist about the Statue of Liberty and I want to engage in realist discourse with Brian or with any of you about the Statue of Liberty, I need both of those sorts of coordination. And the standard realist picture, this model theoretic realist picture, um, establishes interpersonal coordination as a result of having first established a word for world coordination, right? There's some story to be told, modulo sort of partner type worries, there's some story to be told about how when I talk about the Statue of Liberty, I'm picking out a thing. When Brian talks about the Statue of Liberty, he's picking out a thing. And because of the manner in which it's set up, model theoretically, the idea is those locutions are just picking out the same thing in the world. And as a corollary, it means that there's, there's interpersonal communication. Right? But these two things are conceptually distinct and they will come about in, in, in what follows. And so the way in which we usually establish a, a, a word world coordination is via what I'll refer to as external referential crutches. Right? So Brian and I are talking about the Statue of Liberty. This is not the first time either of us is engaging in that kind of discourse. We're not using the conversation we're having right now to figure out what we're talking about, right? I know I'm talking about the Statue of Liberty because I've been there, I've seen it, I've, you know, I've stood in front of it and someone's pointed it and gone, that's the Statue of Liberty. And I've gone, yes, I know. Um, and, and I assume something similar has happened with other people who, whom, I, whom I'm talking to this about. And so whatever further conversations we might have about it, whatever, whatever further properties or relations we might ascribe to the, to the Statue of Liberty, the reference has been settled independently of whatever discourse we're currently engaged in, right? Either by abstention, right? Someone's pointed it to me when I was there, or by description with respect to some other discourse. Um, and a lot of these sorts of scientific realist claims, uh, and indeed a lot of the inferentialist claims that I'm going to be discussing in the, in the later part of this talk, kind of proceed under the assumption that there's some kind of external referential crutch that just gets the project off the ground. And that's something that I want to, that I want to sort of push back against. So that's really, I mean, the, the point of this section was to, to just highlight these two types of semantic coordination. They're going to play an important role in what follows. But now let's return to thinking about the standard way uh, in which, well, a standard way in which you might think that theory latches onto the world. Um, we'll come back to the coordination thing in a minute. Now, here's, here's a very naive but quite compelling and sort of largely, uh, you know, in many domains, quite useful picture, right? So imagine I've got some theory. The theory could be just an everyday theory about chairs and tables and their properties. It could be a scientific theory, right? So imagine something like Newtonian mechanics. That thing over there is supposed to be a cricket ball, but my Inkscape skills are just non-existent. Um, but if I've got a theory um, like Newtonian mechanics, which is a pretty good theory for understanding or predicting, you know, the trajectories of cricket balls, I'm going to imagine for now that this is just going to be understood as a collection of sentences or a collection of models from which you can derive certain sentences, which model certain sentences. And one of those sentences will say something like, if a cricket ball has such and such a, you know, has such and such initial conditions with respect to maybe some coordinate system, then it will execute such and such a, a trajectory, right? And so the way the theory is latching onto the world is by, is by incorporating an expression, cricket ball, and that expression stands in a re relation of reference to a cricket ball out there in the world. And so we use the theory, we, we discover that it's very good for predicting and describing various things to do with cricket balls. But then we, we think, okay, well, let's use this theory sort of beyond that domain. For example, let's use it to try to talk about uh, the constituents of cricket balls, right? Whatever they might be. Um, in particular, let's talk about the unobservable constituents of cricket balls to the extent that we believe in them. And we say, okay, well, what does Newtonian mechanics have to say about things like atoms and molecules understood in a particular way? And it turns out that it has non-trivial things to say. They might not be correct, but it has non-trivial things to say. Um, and the manner in which Newtonian mechanics comes to latch onto the world is, is exactly the same. It's via this relation of reference, where instead of reference of cricket ball to cricket ball, we're thinking about something like reference of atom to atom or molecule to molecule. But again, the descriptive tools are exactly the same. Right? So it's capturing the in the same way idea. Now, we know perfectly well that it, it, this is not going to work for something like Newtonian mechanics. It's going to break down at some point. But that's not really a big deal. Right? You say, okay, fine. You know, there's, it's, there's, a, there's a more fundamental theory that underpins it, you know, some kind of you know, maybe relativistic or non-relativistic form of mechanics, depending on, on, on the situation. And there's going to be some relation of emergence or reduction 
between the between the two of them. In this talk, I'm not particularly worried about the up down arrow. I'm more interested in the left right arrow or the right left arrow. And on this view, which I take to be the sort of standard view in a lot of the philosophy of science, at least since Nagel, is that what, what, what's happening here is the descriptive resources of this are the same as the descriptive resources of that. So all this is doing is it's correcting the proclamations about reference that that theory might also make. But really, we're still using uh, we're still using reference to um, to as it were latch linguistic bits of this theory onto the world. So again, the descriptive apparatus has not changed very much, and that seems fine. I mean, there's there's a, there's a whole lot of very good work that's gone into trying to understand even modern physics as being able to tell a referential story, even though on the on the you know on the surface it doesn't look like you're going to be able to tell a referential story. So I want to look a little bit at what some of the problems might be in telling a realist referential story about something like this. Right, this is a Feynman diagram. And when I was first introduced to Feynman diagrams, as it were just across the street in King's College, um, I was sort of unproblematically told that, you know, oh, this thing is, this thing is a photon, or this thing represents a photon, or this thing represents an electron. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of very hard to break out of the idea that you know, really, these were introduced as a way of understanding terms in a perturbative expansion, right? <laughs> it's the same as sort of pointing to an integral sign and saying that's that represents something in the world. Like, what does it? It's telling. It's 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 part of the tools that allow me to say things about the world. But you know, what the, the representational function, as it were, of any of these aspects of uh, of of, a, of something like a Feynman diagram are obscure at best. And so, the idea that you can tell some kind of referential story seems not not great, especially since. You know, the claim is not this Feynman diagram represents the process. It's this is one out of infinitely many Feynman diagrams that's going to uh, sort of make a contribution to the calculation about some scattering amplitude, right? Nonetheless, there's definitely some kind of representational role that's being played by these squiggly lines in all of these in all of these diagrams. What's clear to me is that that's not going to be a referential role, but what's less clear to me is it's not going to be representational at all. I think that's false. And I think what we need to do is think a little bit about the kind of representational story we want to tell when confronted with stuff that doesn't fit into the sort of Procrustean bed of, of Tarski and model theoretic semantics. That's what, I want to, that's what I want to do today. In particular, one of the problems with, with uh, this story about representation with using the Feynman diagrams is we don't really have any external referential crutches to appeal to, right? We understand what photons and electrons are via quantum field theory. It's not like it's not like we've been presented all of the stuff and then been given quantum field theory as you know the, 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 the description of how these things sort of interact. No. What it is to be an electron for us is determined entirely by our understanding of what's going on quantum field theoretically, right? Unlike with the Statue of Liberty. So we have no external referential crutches to appeal to. But you might say, okay, all this means is we should be motivated to figure out a reformulation of quantum field theory in such a way that we can Give it a, maybe a higher order uh, um, sort of formulation, higher order model theoretic formulation, and then use um, our, our ideas of reference. We might not have any external referential crutches, but there's still there's still the possibility that we can tell some kind of referential story. And I don't wanna, I don't want to rule that out, but I want to say that even if we do somehow conspire to tell this referential story, given my overall interest in scientific realism. What's going to happen is we're then going to be up against the standard sorts of arguments from theory change worries with scientific realism, right? Things like the pessimistic metal induction, um, which basically says, you know, the success of, you know, the successful reference cannot be a necessary component for the success of science. And so the success of science shouldn't be taken as evidence for successful reference. And I think that's great. I, I think we have to deal with it. And so my suggestion is, well, what we're going to do, what we need to figure out is some alternative way of thinking about representation in such a way that we can um, sort of legitimately articulate a realist uh, interpretation of what's, of what's going on, at least in a, in, a, in a sort of mathematically articulated theory. And so the view of scientific representation that I think is a bit more common these days, certainly since the, the, the structural realist literature of the, the late 90s and early 2000s and, 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 and forward, is Okay, well, whatever this lower, this, this more fundamental theory is, 
it need not have referential resources to pick out something in the world. So let's just call this, let's just call the relation that it stands in the relation of scientific representation or just representation more generally. And I mean, this is, this is terminology I borrowed from a recent paper by David Wallace. If we're articulating these theories using mathematical, you know, primarily using mathematical resources, then we've got to figure out some kind of bespoke representation relation that's going to latch our uh, math mathematized theory onto the world. Now, this picture, in the way that I've presented it to you, um, assumes what I call relationism, right? The view is, so if you, if, you, if you look back at this, the way that I presented it is, look, there's something in this theory, there's something out there in the world, and there's some two or maybe n place relation between those, uh, between the, the linguistic thing and the, and the worldly thing. That's very straightforward. But the, but the sort of semantically important uh, aspect of this view is, it's in virtue of that relation that the, that the words come to mean what they do, right? Or the expressions come to mean what they do. The idea is you figure out the gluing, it's in virtue of, uh, you know, Statue of Liberty being glued onto Statue of Liberty or Fermion being glued onto something in the world or squiggly line being glued onto photons. Um, that the squiggly line comes to mean photon or, or Statue of Liberty comes to mean Statue of Liberty. A special case of this is what I call referentialism, Right, where instead of the, the, some more, the more nebulous relation of, uh, of scientific representation, uh, we just think of the, the reference relation. Right? And this is the view that's, um, uh, that's sort of on, the, on the top level of the diagram on the previous page. Right? There are linguistic entities, they stand in the reference relation to things in the world, and in virtue of that, those linguistic entities mean what they do. Right? Maybe even partly, maybe there are other things that go into determining what, what they mean, but and an important component of what it is that gives meaning to those terms is, is this relation. Um, as you can probably guess, I'm going to argue against that. But the reason that I bring this up, and now to tie this back to what I, what I was saying about the array descriptions earlier, is the standard view of realism that you'll, that you'll encounter in the literature, this model theoretic referentialist view, ties the array ascription of a, of a realist commit, of a commitment um, to, a particular, to a scientific realist, and it does so via this reference relation, right? The idea is, I, have a, I make a Duray claim about the Statue of Liberty. Um, I, I might even make a Duray ascription to Brian about the Statue of Liberty. I might say Brian says of the Statue of Liberty that it's tall or green or whatever. Um, I am making a, I'm making a claim about some object in the world, and I'm referring to that object, right? I'm saying, or in this case, I'm saying, I'm speaking off the object that Brian refers to, but the DeRay ascription proceeds via the reference relation. The reference relation is kind of inextricable from the, from the DeRay ascription. And so now if we have to do away with the reference relation, the question is, can we, can we still get this realist impulse going with some alternative to, um, to referentialism, right? Without, in other words, without using referential semantics. And I think the structural realists are completely right that we can, and we should, right? Again, notwithstanding the possibility of a reformulation that still uses reference, I think, no, there's good reason to believe that that's, well, in any case, that's a project that I don't want to be involved in. Um, and there's good reason to believe that. But, um, but yeah, the, the, the structural realist promissory note is, yes, we can come up with the appropriate representation relation. Um, and my goal today is, to, in a sense, to cash in that promissory note. Right? By doing something more than merely stipulating what kind of relation that is, I want to derive the appropriateness of, um, of that. I don't want to say relation because that suggests relationism. Derive the appropriateness of that kind of coordination. And so my claim today, this is the, the sort of the, the fundamental claim, is we need to make a claim about metasemantics. We need, we need to make a claim about the appropriate semantics. And the manner in which we're going to come to make good decisions about the appropriate semantics is by embracing an inferential meta semantics. And once we do that, we will discover that it does in fact deliver the appropriate semantics, depending on which what your domain of, uh, of discussion is. So as we see later on in the talk, I'm going to argue that inferential meta semantics will deliver task and model theory as the appropriate semantics for everyday claims about chairs and tables. It will also just deliver task in semantics as the appropriate semantics for, for things like astrophysics. But it will also suggest an alternative to, to, to that sort of model theoretic semantics for um, things like quantum field theory. 
So now let's uh, let's return to that quote from Fine, because I think that this thinking about things this way suggests two ways in which we can read Fine. The first reading is one according to which the in the same way locution just said, just means we need to use the same semantic resources. And I think this is the way in which most of the literature has, you know, to the extent that they've got Fine in the back of their mind. This is this is uh, what most of the literature is aligned with when when thinking about uh, scientific realism. But what I want to suggest is, no, you can still talk about in the same way, but that same way cover, captures, captures a metasemantic thesis, which then delivers different semantic resources for different, different sorts of theories. Uh, and so I want to argue that the scientific realists should adopt the second reading about modern physics. Um, and if they do that, then they're in a position to articulate um, sort of a, a, a hopefully quite robust scientific realism. Um, so that was the introduction. Let me just briefly summarize what, um, what I presented to you. This is by a long way the longest section of the talk. The rest of it will just fly by. Um, so the scientific realist impulse that I started with was the idea that I should, you know, we should all take physicists seriously, or at least as seriously about the inaccessible bits of the world as we take them about the accessible bits of the world. Um, and the standard way to do this is via some kind of referential semantics, but we've got two problems with that, right? It doesn't play well with, with you know, finite diagrams and quantum field theory, uh, but it really doesn't play well with scientific realism. Uh, and given that that's what we, you know, that's what we want to discuss, that seems like a bad thing. Um, the structural realists, I think, correctly diagnose the problem, or at least are partly correct to diagnose the problem over here as being a problem of referentialism, right? And they suggest alternative sorts of semantic resources. Um, but the suggestion always, always proceeds by a stipulation. And a stipulation, an argument for which really comes down to, well, this one will work, rather than any kind of deeper sort of metasemantic thesis that sort of leads to that. What I want to provide today is that metasemantic thesis, right? So I want to say, no, look, my diagnosis is that referentialism is wrong, but that's as, that only because it's relationalism that is wrong. It's relationalism that's to blame, right? The idea that the meanings are grounded in that word-to-word -word gluing. And so my solution is we drop relationalism, that's the, that's the negative suggestion. The positive suggestion is we adopt instead uh, an expressivist metasemantics. And then the claim is the appropriate, the appropriate sort of first order semantics. No, I shouldn't say first order. The, the appropriate semantics will, will follow automatically. And so that's what I'm going to do in the rest of this talk. Uh, I'm going to very briefly in the next section talk to you about expressivism as a, as a metasemantic thesis and inferentialism as a, as a species of expressivism. Um, I'm then going to sort of apply this to a, a, an intuitively plausible test case, namely realism about things that I think we should all be realists about, if we're going to be realists, so everyday objects. The example that I'll use is, is the Statue of Liberty. And then I'm going to take exactly that and, um, and see how, this, how it plays with, um, with quantum field theory, or with a very, very basic bit of quantum field theory. Um, so this section of the talk, okay, so bra bracket what I've said now, I'm now just going to introduce you to a little bit of uh, philosophy of language, uh, and in particular expressivism. So here's the slogan. Well, not quite as yet. Slogan will be here in a minute. Um, so expressivism is, it's, it's a view that we've ultimately, uh, that was bestowed upon us by various discussions in metaethics. Um, and it's a view according to which, you know, in the, in the great tradition of, of, of philosophical analysis going, oh, you shouldn't be fooled by the surface grammar of these claims into thinking that they're like these other claims. The idea is um, there are certain claims in certain domains that might look like they're declarative in the sense, like, in the sense that they look like they're telling you about things in the world and how the world is, or things in the world and how they are, right? Usually by ascribing properties to objects but are in fact not, right? The surface grammar is misleading. The, the, a good example is, you know, a, a claim like murder is wrong, right? Expressivists about those sorts of claims will say, no, look, it might look very similar to a claim like the table is, is rigid, right? Ascribing a property to, instead of an object, in this case, to a practice. But really that's not right. You shouldn't be fooled by the surface grammar. The claim that murder is wrong is not ascribing to murder the property of wrongness, is instead, allowing us as subjects, as participants in the world, to express our attitudes towards the subjects of those claims. So another way of thinking about this is the expressivist will say, or the expressivist about murder claims, will say, if someone says murder is wrong, that's more akin to giving it a thumbs down. Uh, uh, you know, 
And so because normally the examples are with thumbs ups, and then I chose to use murder. And then it, anyway, um, so yeah, so murder is wrong. It's 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 not ascribing a property of murder. It's 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 saying of people who make that claim that they're giving a thumbs down or a boo or a nay to um, the murder. Um, it's important to know that expressivists come sort of in many different in, there are many different versions of expressivism depending on how you delineate that domain of discourse about which you want to be an expressivist. Um, so an example, a famous example from, from Gibbard is um, an expressivism about rationality or rational permissibility. Um, and this is a good example because it, it uh, sets out one sort of quite precise way in which you can be an expressivist across the board, and that is by accepting a, series, a system of norms, right? So for Gibbard, expressivism about rationality, uh, right, allows you to analyze claims like X is rationally permissible, again, not by attributing to X the property of being rationally permissible, but, but rather uh, as expressing an acceptance of a system of norms according to which X is permitted. More recently, uh, our dear friend Josh Hunt has, I think, extremely convincingly argued that uh, we should be expressivists about the explanatory re relevance relation, right? And again, he does this by invoking uh, a series of uh, uh, sort of consonants with a series of norms as being the thing that is expressed, right? So again, the, 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 the thumbs up or the thumbs down is a thumbs up or a thumbs down to an assessment relative to a background of norms. And that's exactly what I'm going to be arguing for today um, as my as the expressivist thesis that I want to that I want to defend. And in particular, rather than worrying about explanatory relevance or rationality, I want to talk about an expressivism about semantic vocabulary, by which I mean the vocabulary that sort of establishes the word-to-word -word coordination, right? Vocabulary like reference, representation, truth, that sort of thing. And so I want to, I'm going to invoke the, the, the Sellers Brandon tradition, um, according to which the expressive role of semantic vocabulary is to make explicit the conceptual content associated with, um, with what is implicit in the norms governing a particular linguistic practice. There was a whole lot of words there, and I think the easiest way to, to get a sense of what's going on is via an example. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you an example not of semantic vocabulary, because that requires a little bit more work, which we'll do in the third section of the talk. My example is going to be one of logical vocabulary, so expressivism about logical. Yeah. Um, so the question is, when we talk about these, 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 the norms that, that sort of underpin a particular kind of expressivism, what are the norms? And the sellers Brandon claims the norms are inferential norms, right? They are norms that keep track of inferential commitments and entitlements associated with particular linguistic performances, right? When I say something, when I make a claim, right, whether you're doing this consciously or not, you are associating with me certain commitments that follow from that claim, right? I made the claim that the statute of liberty is green. You are tacitly, given the linguistic community that we're embedded in, at the very least, you're tacitly committed to the idea that I also believe that the statute, or uh, well, I also believe that the statute of liberty has a color, or I also believe that the statute of liberty is visible, right? That's a commitment that you legitimately ascribe to me. And really, the 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 job of semantic vocabulary is to make those sorts of Tacit commitments explicit. Um, that's what I just said. And so, um, what, yeah, as I said, the example that I'm going to give you in this section is not of sort of a particularly complicated bit of semantic vocabulary. That's still to come. But I will show you how this works in a simple case of logical vocabulary, right? So suppose you am in a car and I'm uh, and I've stopped at a uh, at a traffic light, and I'm, and the traffic light is red, it's flashing red, and so I'm committed to accepting the traffic light is currently flashing red. Right? on the basis of my sort of perceptual evidence. Here's the thing that I am also thereby, I think, committed to, uh, or should be thought of correctly as being committed to, which is the idea that the traffic light is not also currently flashing green. Right? I don't, I mean, I know there are traffic lights that have multiple lights flashing at the same time, but I don't think they've ever, I don't think there are any lights that do red and green at the same time. In any case, imagine that that's the, that's the, that's the scenario, right? So one of my commitments, is to a particular kind of incompatibility, namely the incompatibility of red flashing and green flashing at the same time. And of course, evidence that I'm committed to that norm is the fact that I don't run the red light. Right? I don't say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's being red doesn't rule out it being green, and if it's green, then I can go ahead. No, I don't do that. I accept the norm um, tacitly, uh, but I accept a norm, and 
part of what that norm incorporates is a tacit acceptance of a particular kind of incompatibility, right? But then the question is, how do I make this explicit, right? How do, how do I say to you, how do I describe to you the, um, the, 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 the norm that, I'm, that, I, that I tacitly or implicitly accept? Well, that's when I use logical vocabulary, right? In this case, I use the, vocab the vocabulary of negation, of not. Um, so if the, if the traffic light is flashing red, then it is not flashing green. Is the explicitation, right, this is a sort of brand dominism, it's the making explicit of an implicit commitment in my, um, in my practice. And so the idea is, okay, well, this is an example, this is a particularly simple example, um, but just as the expressive um, role of not is to make clear incompatibilities, and there are various other aspects of our linguistic practice that need to be captured, there are going to be other bits of vocabulary that will capture those, those bits of our linguistic practice, right? Things, you know, you might, you might think, I, 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 I want to understand uh, sort of implicit implication, right? Well, there's going to be some vocabulary whose expressive role is to make that explicit. What we're going to see later on in the talk is I, I'm going to want to be able to talk about deray ascriptions, uh, added, uh, ascriptions of deray attitudes, and there's going to be a bit of vocabulary that's going to uh, allow the expressivist to tell the story about that. That's really all we need about expressivism. So let me just briefly summarize that. Right? So the idea is there are some sentences that look like they're declarative, but are on, on philosophical reflection discovered not to be, and expressivism uh, offers a story about how to understand those. There are various ways in which you can be an expressivist, but the ones that I focused on are norm expressivists, and the norms of interest in this talk are inferential norms, hence inferentialism. Um, and because this is a rule-based understanding of these norms, uh, Random uses the term deontic scorekeeping as a, as a way of describing us keeping track of our interlocutors' commitments and entitlements with respect to which we can understand these norms. And an important thing that, that, that needs to be pointed out about, um, about this kind of expressivism is we've shifted our focus from thinking of sentences as just these sorts of, th these things that independently of all of us may or may not capture or express propositions with propositions understood as things like possible worlds or states of affairs or situations or whatever. We've now got the speaker kind of front and center in this, in this story about, um, about what it is that's happening when people are engaged in a linguistic practice. Um, and that's going to be important as well in what follows. Right, so now let's, let's put all of this together and let's try, to, let's try to formulate a story, an inferentialist, expressivist, realist, a lot of words, um, story about, in this case, in, well, in this section, everyday entities, and then we'll move on to science. So here are, here are two claims that different kinds of realists might want to, might want to, might want to endorse, right? The, the sort of what you might call the, the, the general metaphysical realist or the, the, the naive realist or whatever, uh, will want to assent to the Statue of Liberty as green. That seems fine. And the way that they assent to that is by a, a, a dirty attitude about the Statue of Liberty. And of course, if you're thinking about things in the same way, what you want to do is ascribe, if you're a scientific realist, um, you want to understand the fermions are unobservable and have some property, right? A way of exclusion principle. You want to understand that as also ascribing um, a dairy a dairy attitude. But of course, given what I said at the end of the last section, I want to argue that this is not the primary unit of analysis. These are the primary units of analysis. It's, it's a speaker making that claim, right? So I want to say I'm interested in understanding the dairy ascription associated with the, the claim that I might make that Priya says that the Statue of Liberty is green uh, in the everyday case, or Katie says that uh, fermions are unobservable in the scientific case. So as I said, in this section, I'm going to concentrate on the Statue of Liberty claim. In the next one, I'll come to the exclusion principle claim. The first thing to note is that there's a bit of an ambiguity, sort of a well-known ambiguity. Uh, when you think about a claim like um, Priya claims that the Statue of Liberty is green, it's a deray de dicto ambiguity. And as I've argued, it's the deray component that's sort of central to our realist story. So what we want to do is reformulate that as a claim that makes explicit that we're dealing with a, with a deray locution. Right? So you say Priya claims off the Statue of Liberty that it is green. The way that you can see that this is a deray ascription is imagine I replace Statue of Liberty with unicorns. Right? And I say Priya believes that unicorns are green, but there are no unicorns. That seems like a perfectly fine thing to say. But I can't say something like Priya believes off unicorns that they are green, but there are no unicorns. Because I'm tacitly committed in saying Priya believes off unicorns that there are unicorns. And so there's a, so there's a contradiction there. 
So what the opt that locution allows us to do is be sort of very clear that we're making a DeRay description. And DeRay descriptions come with commitments for the ascriber of those uh, of, of DeRay commitments. Right? So what is that off that locution over here doing? It's signaling, it's playing the extra linguistic role of signaling Priya's attitude towards some purportedly worldly thing. Right? Purportedly on my part, I purport to accept the um, the existence of the Statue of Liberty, and then say of that thing whose existence I, I'm, I'm committed to, that Priya has a particular attitude. So again, the, 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 the expressive role of the author application is that it's making explicit this representational aspect, this Dury aspect of the, um, of the linguistic performance, given the context that we're embedded in. So the question is, if we're going to be expressivists in the way that I, that I described in the last section, um, how are we going to do this and still hold on to realism, right? Because expressivism recommends that we drop relationism, right? And if we drop relationism, we also have to drop referentialism. And I'd mentioned in the, in the, in the first section of the talk that the DeRay descriptions for normal realist talk proceeds via the reference relation. So if we don't have that, what do we do? Well, we still need to vindicate the DeRay impulse. We still need to vindicate the DeRay story, but now we have to do it we have to tell a totally different story, one that doesn't rely on relationism or, or, or referentialism. And so the question is, how do we identify the linguistic practices that are such that they are tacitly practices that ascribe the attitudes, no matter what the linguistic resource is? Um, and once we do that, we will be in a position to understand how the claims can be attributed to uh, particular sorts of people. Right? And this is where the 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 technical machinery of, of Brandon's making it explicit and works since then uh, comes in. So what Brandon says is the following. He says, look, dairy attitudes, dairy attitude descriptions are signaled in whatever language, in some alien language, as much as in natural, a natural language by, like English, by the fact that we can keep track or we are expected to keep track, given those, those locutions, of three aspects of the deontic score. One aspect is the set of commitments associated with the person to whom I ascribe the Dury attitude. The second is a set of entitlements ascribed to that person. And the third is a set of commitments that I myself undertake, right? So in the example of Priya says of the Statue of Liberty that it's green, one of the things that I said was, well, that tacitly commits me to an existence claim, right? It commits me to a claim uh, that the Statue of Liberty is something out there in the world. It doesn't say very much about how I come to sort of glue my locution of Statue of Liberty onto the world, but I'll say more about that in what follows, right? So let's do this explicitly now. So what are, what are the three, what were the three things? Priya's entitlements. So I might say, I might say, you know, if Priya believes that the, you know, Priya thinks that the Statue of Liberty is green or claims that the Statue of Liberty is green, um, that seems completely consistent with her believing that it's worth visiting. It's not mandated, right? I don't think there's, there's any axiom that says if something is green, then it's worth visiting, but it's not inconsistent with it, right? So in the normative sort of vocabulary that we're using, an entitlement kind of corresponds to a permission, but then there's a stronger thing, right? There's a the thing that corresponds to the obligation, and the obligation there is, is um, captured by the set of commitments, right? And the commitments are things like it has a color or it's visible, right? And you know various other things given other background commitments that that uh, that Priya might have, but then and this is a, this is the important thing. There's also there's also the thing that I have to be committed to, right? So I might undertake some of the commitments that Priya undertakes or that I believe that Priya has undertaken. I might undertake others. In particular, I might undertake really bad thoughts, right? I might have some background beliefs that, in conjunction with um, understanding the claim that the Statue of Liberty is green will lead me to certain commitments. Those commitments might be bad, but their commitments are the same, right? I might have some back, some weird background belief that makes me think that I should stop at a traffic signal when, uh, when it's green. And so if someone tells me that the Statue of Liberty is green, you put those two together and you end up with this weird, uh, with this weird undertaking, right? Why is this helpful? Why is this important? Well, it's important because Priya and I can disagree hugely with respect to the properties we ascribe to the Statue of Liberty, right? But we can nonetheless, via these sorts of locutions, via these sorts of linguistic practices, be sure that she and I are talking about the same thing, right? This allows us, the, the fact that I'm attributing a direct commitment 
to, to Priya and thereby incurring an existential commitment myself, allows for a coordination with respect to our talk about that thing, even if we're not coordinated with respect to all of our commitments regarding that thing. We can both pick up the Statue of Liberty because of, um, because of the expressive role that's being played in these of that sorts of locutions, and in particular, because we're keeping track of these different sets of commitments and entitlements, even if we have different sets of background commitments and entitlements. And that's, that's the thing that's doing a, a the really important work in establishing interpersonal communication, right? Another way of thinking about this is just as I attribute to Priya certain commitments and entitlements when she says uh, the Statue of Liberty is green, she might play the same game with me, right? So I might make a claim about the Statue of Liberty. I might say the Statue of Liberty is tall. And then she'll keep track of my commitments and entitlements and, and, the, and her undertakings as a result. And in doing that, she also establishes an interpersonal coordination. Right. The important thing is we might disagree on what that interpersonal coordination sort of points to in the world. But given that we've dropped relationism, that's not really a problem. What we then need to do is figure out a way to coordinate that. But this is the first part of the story in which our sort of interpersonal coordination is established by the attribution of a Dere, um, a Dere attitude. You might worry given all of the sort of language, sort of intra language stuff that I've been talking about, that we've kind of lost track of the world, right? How is, where does the world come into any talk about inferences and commitments and entitlements? And Well, in the, you know, if you just think about it for a minute, you'll realize that the deontic score is affected not just by the locutions, not just by what people are saying, but also by what the world is like, right? So in particular, for the example, yeah, yeah. So I might be penalized by the way the world is, for making a bad inference that I've, that I've arrived at by playing this deontic scorekeeping game, right? So for example, I might have a bad inference that um, I should stop at a green light because I should stop at, at a light that's the same color as the Statue of Liberty. And then the world will penalize me, right? I might be rear ready. And so there are various ways in which um, the, the, the world kind of impinges on our linguistic practice. And that's the thing that's establishing a, a, a linguistic practice world kind of link rather than any kind of antecedent sort of magical semantic gluing, what's really happening is there are a bunch of people that are engaged in a bunch of things, a bunch of activities that are all constrained by the way the world is. One of the activities that you can engage in is a kind of linguistic activity, and the world being the way that it is affects the manner in which that linguistic activity is, um, is done, practiced, I guess. Um, Right. Uh, did I have a thing there? Yeah. So the expressive role in this case of the of that locution is to explicit or to make explicit representational content. This is important, right? And this is really the crux of, of the of, this is why the inferentialism uh, material ends up being really helpful for us. Note that I said that uh, on this view, the meanings of words. I mean, the examples that I gave were of logical vocabulary, but the but the idea sort of expands outwards. The meanings of all of your words are articulated inferentially. And what that means is that a claim like the Statue of Liberty is green is meaningful, it's intelligible, it's contentful, independently of whether or not the Statue of Liberty successfully refers, right? Why is that? Well, it's because these, 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 all sort of, um, these are all different nodes in, a, uh, in an inferential network, right? I know what green means because of the way in which I've used green in other contexts and made other inferences on the basis of, of, uh, of the use of that word green. And simply, and similarly, the Statue of Liberty, and also similarly off, right? And various other things. And so if I want to be a realist about the Statue of Liberty, right, I need to establish two things. These are the two things that were simultaneously established by the referentialist right at the beginning. But since we've dropped referentialism, we now need to establish them separately. The first is the interpersonal coordination, and I've just demonstrated how that can be achieved. The second is a word-world coordination between my utterance of the Statue of Liberty and something out there in the world, and some entity out there in the world. How am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to invoke this inferential claim. I'm going to invoke a claim that says, I am well, I can understand, I know the meanings of the Statue of Liberty is green, all of those words individually, because of the manner in which they stand in inferential relations to other words that I understand. So it's a, it's a, kind, of, it's a kind of holism about meaning and understanding. Uh, and sort of eliding the difference between meaning and understanding, those are two distinct sort of concerns that are addressed by inferentialism, but that 
not really going to touch what I'm saying today. And so my claim is that the manner in which we achieve this word-to-world -word coordination is via a linguistic practice that is sufficiently inferentially rich as to be able to allow us to uniquely pick out uh, things in the world. The world being the way it is affects our linguistic practice in a particular way. If our linguistic practice is, is as a result sufficiently inferentially rich, then my use of terms like the Statue of Liberty will establish the world-to-world -world coordination completely independently of any stipulation or any kind of sort of relational metaphysical sort of gluing of those two of those two entities. Right? So I might have an inferential network that is rich enough on its own to, to, to pick up the Statue of Liberty, and then I can make various claims about the Statue of Liberty. I might have an inferential network that is just in, that, that is really rich, you know, um, has, you know, sort of sufficiently well articulates the meanings of various sorts of claims in such a way as to deny successful records, right? And I think a, a standard example of this kind of thing is the King of France's Borg, right? The, the old example, the old Rosalian example. And the idea there is I know what King means, I know what France means, and I know what Borg means as a result of the inferential links that they stand into the rest of my discourse. And I know that well enough to know that the King of France doesn't refer, right? So there's, so there's an absence of successful reference in that case. But these are two extremes. And all of the practices, the different sorts of practices that they were engaged in will fall generally somewhere in between, right? The practice may or may not be rich enough to pick out unique, a, a, a unique referent for, for various sorts of linguistic expression, right? So I might say something like the most Mazedar fielder took a catch in yesterday's cricket match. But, you know, Mazedar, you know, I know what it means, but that's because I speak a different language. Um, the, the, you know, the community that I'm embedded in right now, at least in this room and sort of in this country, uh, is such that the inferential links associated with that word are not sufficiently rich to make, uh, to, to allow people to pick out, uh, you know, one of the 22 people um, who, who played yesterday's cricket match. And this is how I can be a realist about the Statue of Liberty. This is how I can be an anti-realist about the King of France. And this is how I can be agnostic about Mazedar fielders. Right? And so the idea is it's inferential richness that's going to achieve that second thing. It's going to, in some practices, right, as a contingent fact about how some practices have evolved, those practices are going to allow us to replace those external referential crutches for achieving this, the, the second aspect of coordination. And uh, once, we, once we have that, that's all we need, because then we've got a way of ascribing dirty attitudes without worrying about reference, without worrying about relationism. We can tell a wholly expressive story. And it's completely realist, right? It's, it's ascribing a sort of mind independence to the world. And it's ascribing uh, an impact to the world on us as a linguistic community, as, as sort of entities that exist in the world and interact with it in a particular way. So let me summarize this. The last section is going to be really quick because it's just going to go by analogy with what I said over here. Um, so as I said, the expressivist needs to vindicate uh, particular sorts of locutions. In the everyday case where referential locutions are the sorts of things we want to vindicate, they need to do that, but without <laughs> accepting relationism, right? And so the, so the way that we need to do that is we need to be able to talk about a deray uh, attribution of attitudes without using referential crutches. So what we do is we look at our linguistic practice and we look at the sorts of uh, turns of phrase that signal uh, these deray attributions, and then we analyze those. We see what it is about those um, about those linguistic terms of terms of phrase that allow us to do that. I use the, the, the Brambilmian story, the deontic scorekeeping model. What happens as a result of thinking about things this way is we've divorced referential success from meaning, which is good. Well, we've divorced it in one sense. In another sense, reference does, of course, depend on, you know, mean, reference still supervenes on meaning in the way that we want it to, but it is now not a necessary component of a, of a story of meaning. And then, so that, that, was the, that was the first part of the deray. The second part is the sort of word of world, and that's going to be established by the richness of, uh, of the inferential network. Right. Brief to quickly finish now, because uh, I'm uh, got a few more minutes. Um, how are we going to tell the story for the scientific realist? Well, um, supposing we want, to, we want to vindicate a claim that Katie claims that fermions are unobservable and that they obey Pauli's exclusion principle. Now, I'm using fermion in this case just because I couldn't copy and paste that Feynman diagram or infinitely many Feynman diagrams, whatever. But really, it's a, that, that is to be treated as pure shorthand, uh, pure abbreviation for, what is, for the thing that is represented um, in, as a, by a solid line in a, in, a, in a collection of Feynman diagrams. Right? So the idea is, Given, given a set of Feynman diagram or, a, you know, more broadly, a, a quantum field theoretic setup, 
how is it that we can vindicate claims like uh, like this about about the unobservability, but nonetheless existence of, of, of certain aspects? Well, play the same game again, right? We do exactly what we did with the statute of liberty case, um, except that we don't think referentially. Right, so the first thing is we paraphrase it to make the deray the derayness obvious, right? So we paraphrase it using an off that locution. So Katie claims of fermions that they are unobservable and that they obey the exclusion principle. The second step is establish the interpersonal coordination. That's going to be done once again in exactly the same way by keeping track of these three sets of things: commitments and entitlements as attributed to Katie and commitments that I undertake myself. And then the step, the third step is establish the world-to-world -world coordination. And that's going to be done by exploring the richness of the inferential web that we have given uh, given the vocabulary that we that we allow ourselves to. And I'm thinking of Feynman diagrams as part of the vocabulary in a, in a, in a broader sense. So let's do this explicitly. What are the what are the inferential commitments uh, and entitlements that I attribute to Katie? Well, here's one that I can attribute to her. No two fermions uh, can be in the same quantum state. You might think that that's definitional, but anyway, that's a, well, even if it is definitional, that's a, that's that's a that's a commitment that she incurs. But recall that I didn't really say anything about what sorts of relations these inferential relations are, right? So the, if, if you read Brandon, most of the book is dedicated to understanding deductive inferential relations. But I think we should, not just me, lots of people believe that um, we, should, we should be much more permissive about the, the, the acceptable inferences. So in particular, you might believe that some kind of uh, abductive inference is, is perfectly kosher. I, I, I know I do. Um, and so I might then attribute to Katie the commitment that, uh, you know, some claim about the stability of matter that follows from the, uh, from accepting the, uh, the, um, the claim about Pauli's exclusion principle, right? So that's, that's how I'm keeping track of Katie's commitments. I haven't said anything about entitlements, but you can, you know, add whatever you like to that, really, as long as it's not uh, incompatible. But then I might... I might undertake a particular well, one commitment that I've undertaken is the Dirac commitment, right? I believe there's something in the world that, uh, that in some sense corresponds to the thing represented by the squiggly line. But I might, might also have other commitments, right? I might have background beliefs about what it is that Pauli's exclusion principle tells us about the world, right? I've never seen Pauli's exclusion principle as applied to things that are within my perceptual grasp. So I might believe that Pauli's exclusion principle, something satisfies our Pauli's exclusion principle is sort of sufficient to understand as being beyond my, my perceptual grasp. I might be wrong, but I might have that commitment. But as soon as I've done this, as soon as I've played this game, right, as soon as I've made this off that locution and then kept track of these, I have enough to, to, to establish interpersonal coordination, right? So now, what about step three? Well, step three is just to look at the context of the, or the practice that I'm embedded in, right? So I've, I've used the ter both the terms community and context, uh, context obviously being just the, the, the more general term, right? Because I might be in a context where uh, the problem that I'm dealing with doesn't have enough, hasn't articulated enough inferential richness for me to pick out anything uniquely. And this is a problem that you come up with, that you come across, for example, when you first look at maybe a double slit experiment, and you're told to treat it just as, uh, as a sort of isolated, as an isolated system, and the, the inferences that you're supposed to draw from that are the inferences that you can draw about how particular operators on Hilbert spaces behave. But then there's always a little bit of a slip in the in the uh, in the use of language that comes later, where you then sort of bring in tacit commitments about what particles are like and like which slit it went through and all of that. And the second you're doing that, you're you're now embedding that sort of austere, isolated example in a broader inferential context. And so the idea is, as you sort of broaden the contexts in which you, you, you embed these inferences, you might end up in a position where you can pick up the things uniquely, right? In the same way that, uh, that we did for, for the Statue of Liberty, right? So a context like that or a community like that, I would just call a realist community. You don't have to be a realist if you're embedded in a realist community. All I'm saying is the realist community has the resources to articulate a particular kind of, of realism. But you might get, instead of getting the thumbs up for, for that sort of delay attribution, you might get the thumbs down, right? And in that case, I'm in a context or a practice that is sufficiently rich to understand what it is that I'm talking about um, when, I, when I'm making the delay claims, but then just denying the existence that I'm committed to, right? And that's an anti-realist community. But most communities, I suggest, will be somewhere in the middle, right? That it's, it's basically going to be agnostic, but some might be more realist than others. Um, and that's what needs to be looked at in order to make an assessment of uh, a claim about scientific realism. 
the context within which one is trying to establish the word-to-world -world connection via the inferential um, by the inferential richness that makes explicit the implicit what is implicit in the practice of that community. That's I guess a slogan. It's a bit long for a slogan, but that's um, and that's it. And th th that's really all I wanted to introduce you to today. So I'm just going to let me briefly summarize this. I have a diagram on the next page, and then I'm done. So recall, and now hopefully it's it's clear why I, I set up realism in terms of Dirac attributions or Dirac commitments. Um, so one of the things that we need to do in order to be realist is we need to establish these two aspects of semantic coordination. Oops. Um, if you're going to be a relationalist in the way that I that I described earlier, you're going to believe that the meanings are determined or grounded in uh, some kind of objective relation between linguistic entities and things in the world. Then you're going to achieve both of those kind of at the same time, just because the manner and because of the way in which the semantics is set up, it just elides any sorts of differences. But I want to suggest that uh, we can be realists without being relationalists by being inferentialists, i.e. expressivists. And so then we have to tell two distinct stories, one about interpersonal coordination and then one about word to world coordination. Interpersonal coordination achieved by, by keeping track of the deontic scope, those three aspects, word to world coordination achieved by the richness of the inferential network. So now we can return to find, right? I don't want to, I don't want to accept reading one. And now I think there's a, the, the, we have slightly more to understand what I mean by mess semantic claims in reading two, right? What I want to say is that the realist about some practice X can use an expressivist inferentialist meta semantics to deliver referential semantics for everyday knowledge claims, as we saw in section three, and a bespoke representational semantics for, um, for quantum, something like quantum field theoretic claims. It will also de deliver a bespoke representational semantics for maybe astrophysical claims that might actually end up being referential semantics. But if it does end up being referential semantics, it ends up being referential semantics for a good reason, the reason being the inferentialist metasemantics. And importantly, you can do all of this without accepting relationism. So now the picture of scientific representation is quite different, right? In the earlier, in the earlier pictures, there was just nothing about communities or linguistic practice. We should probably say communities. Anyway, there was nothing about practice or communities. We just started off with these theories as though, as though they'd been just sort of handed to us by God or by David Malament. Um, but as it happens, <laughs> as it happens um, I think the, the, the really important part of what's going on over here is in the linguistic practice, because then via this process of explicitation, we arrive at what it is that we think of as being the theory. But along with it, we arrive with, uh, along with it, we get the resources to tell the appropriate story about representation. And in particular, it'll allow us to tell the story about representation that's going to make our scientific practice immune, I claim, to worries like the pessimistic meta induction and sort of other, other arguments from theory change, although I didn't argue for that today. But I hope it's it's clear that this sort of provides us with um, with the with the necessary tools. Um, with that, I definitely run out of time, so I'll just leave the summary up here. And thank you very much for your, for your time. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Tushar. So uh, we'll take questions from the two spaces. Uh, there's Zoom attendants, you're welcome to raise your Zoom hand and ask a question. And uh, people in the audience here as well, feel free to ask. Uh, yes, Dominic, go ahead. Hi, really enjoyable talk. Thanks. Way, way more than to get my head on like a compressor. <laughs> One question. Uh, I'm wondering what, let's see, in, in realist debates, you want a normative. I want to have a conversation with anti realists and try mm -hmm. to give them reasons yeah. to be a realist. Yeah. No milk's argument that we want to be doing that. Yeah. I'm not sure how these communities are going to be established because it seems to be like these linguistic communities, the realist one used an anti realist one to sort of exist before the theories do. And so there sort of seems to be no more for like, the no milk's argument in persuading. It's just simply, you accept some norms, what can you do about it? Good, thanks. I think that, I mean, that's a really good question. So I, I don't think it's the case that the communities exist before the theories do, right? I think what's setting up the communities, qua communities, um, whose linguistic practices are around a particular theory is the development of that theory. Right? So you might think that um, that basically what I want to argue against is this idea that things like inference to the best explanation used in the numericals argument is kind of theory transcend is a sort of theory transcendent 
way of arguing for scientific realism. But instead think, no, I'm going to I'm going to sort of keep an open mind about what sorts of inferential links are going to develop as a as a sort of contingent fact about the development of that theory. I will then acquire philosopher of, I guess, in this case, language, um, figure out how to make explicit the, norm, the, the, the implicit norms that have just developed as a result of that. And then I'm going to try to understand whether I'm correct to suggest that one, one explicit norm is a norm of inference to the best explanation, or one implicit norm is a norm that gives you know, a particular kind of realist meaning to, or realist interpretation to particular sorts of words. I guess your question kind of makes me, I think the thing, what I want to, what I want to change a little bit is the suggestion that realist communities and anti-realist communities are different. Really what I want to say is that the two kinds of, there are two kinds of communities well, there's a spectrum, but broadly two kinds. One that's uh, sort of whose inferential uh, richness, whose inferential web is rich enough to support a debate over realism or anti-realism, and others that are not. Uh, and I think sort of tracking the development of particular scientific theories to see if they get to that point then allows us to actually invoke the sorts of arguments that a realist or an anti-realist might want to against the other, precisely because it's only in those communities that we have enough linguistic resources to just get the debate off the ground in the first place, rather than just be talking fast. I mean, that, thanks a lot, Don. That was really, that was really good. Okay, uh, next in the room is uh, Alex, and then uh, we'll go to Isaac after that in the, in the Zoom chat. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so there's a huge... Let me see stand up so I can see. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, it seems like this... Um, all sort of amounts to a note of realism relative to linguistic practice. Um, so, so I wonder how how that like it, it seems then that the same uh, the same sentence or something might be viewed as realist by different communities and anti-realist yeah. by other communities. For example, as you said, I'm not in the in the linguistic community where Mazdar or something yeah. means something right. to yeah. me. Whereas you you are in the yes. community, is it really? I, I just wonder, is it really a good notion of realism in yeah. the end that yeah. will sort of, in in, in the words of Tom, uh, yeah. persuade an anti-realist? Yeah, good. Um, I don't know um, how many anti-realists do I know. I mean, uh, what? so I think I think th this is this is a revisionary uh, sort of. It, it's 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 a. I'm. I'm arguing for a, rev uh, a revision in our understanding of what realism is on the basis of um, the tools that we have at hand to capture that impulse that I had right at the beginning, right? So one way of thinking about what's, what, what I'm doing over here is saying, look, you might have thought realism was some kind of metaphysics first claim, right? Some claim about, um, you know, mind in the uh, mind independent world, and then you append to that some kind of epistemological and then semantic claim. That's generally the way scientific realism is, is presented. And what I want to say is the metaphysical claim is kind of trivial, right? The only metaphysics that we need to get realism off the ground or to get anything off is, is the idea that there's some external world and it impinges on the way we behave in a particular way. What I want to say is the thing that captures the semantic uh, sort of impulses that we have associated with, with scientific realism is really an assessment of the linguistic practices of a community rather than thinking that the semantic rather than thinking that what's going to deliver our semantic intuitions about realism is going to be derived from the metaphysics and so you might say this is not realism to which the answer is well fine but then if you think that there's some different notion of realism I'm worried that ultimately we'll just end up having a merely verbal dispute. And I, I you know, I don't want to I, I don't want to say this captures every notion of realism that's ever been proposed. What I want to say is I feel like I share a realist impulse with a bunch of people, and this is a satisfying story about realism for someone like me. I suspect it'll be acceptable to maybe the Hassett Chang's of the world and sort of other people. And so really what I want to do is instead of saying, I mean, this is the old kind of Sorry, I'm saying a bit more. I'll say one more sentence. This this reminds me a little bit of um, you know what, what in Frank Jackson when he when he uh, in his in his Mary paper sort of presents it as you know this is going to be the argument that's going to convince you to switch sides. And it's like no, this is the argument that's convinced me at best that your side is not insane. And I think that's kind of where I want to sit with this. I just want to say, look, if you think that this is okay, this is this is something that's on the table. If it accords well with your and seen commitments, great. Here's a, here's, a, here's a box that you can tick. If not, 
let's go to the pub and, and, and chat more. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, uh, so I've got um, Isaac in the queue and then Miklos next after that. Uh, go ahead, Isaac. Uh, awesome. Uh, thanks, Tushar, so much for the talk. It was super interesting and glad to join online. Um, my question would be, I think kind of on similar uh, lines as, as um, the past two people, but um, if oh, oh, broadly the question is, how is this scientific realism that we get different from maybe like some kind of moral real, realism we might get like from which the expressivism started so for something like a, um like if we're considering the issue of objectivity on this expressivist picture or inferentialist picture uh without people it seems like murder is neither wrong nor right so like we don't really need to talk about murder if, if there were no people but without people fermions would still obey the poly exclusion principle and and physical things would still do the things they do and so we we, we kind of want to say that there's more or yeah, there's a stronger sense of objectivity on the physical level. Um, and then you would say then maybe uh, that the way where that objectivity comes is from the physics being responsible or being held accountable to the, the way the world is or the world being the way it is. Um, and I, I think I'm struggling, like, how, how can we motivate the way the physical world is without saying, oh, we can equally as well motivate the way the the moral world is um and 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 so so how can we i kind of intuitively want science to be more objective than morality maybe but maybe that's the the wrong intuition here but um if, if that makes sense as a yeah, no, totally. no thanks thanks for the question isaac that's that's really good i think my my response is let, let's let's distinguish between sort of two senses in which the claim might be subject dependent right it might be the case that the subject of the claim itself is it might be that, that the claim is about people, right? And in that sense, murder is wrong is ultimately a claim about, you know, in, in some sense, about things that people do in such a way that if those people didn't exist, you're right, there would just be no, there, there'd be no claims to make about murder. But there's a, there's a separate sense in which the claims that I make, right, the fact that I'm able to make claims and the meanings associated with those claims are, uh, sort of depend for their existence on, on people while the subject associated with those claims doesn't depend on people. And that's the sense in which, uh, and expressivism can work for both of them. But in this case, really what's happening is, okay, here, here, here's what I want, might want to say. You might want to say, if there are no people, then fermion has no meaning. I think that's correct. But then you might also want to say, if there are no people, fermions would still, you know, obey Pauli's exclusion principle. I think that's also correct. And I, I, don't, I, I don't see any sort of conflict there. So I think that's how you're going to get that off. You know, that's the sense in which the, the moral claims and the, and the physical claims are going to be um, sort of distinct with respect to their levels of object, objectivity, but still captured, in my opinion, appropriately by an expressive story. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Miklos and then Joanna. Go ahead, Miklos. Well, I have to say first that I didn't quite understand what, what was going on here in this uh, proposal. But, okay. but I understood, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that this is a proposal about how to be realist, especially in connection with physical theories, physical and yeah. So I'm wondering, would this also help us uh, in understanding how we should be unrealist about certain things? I'm thinking of, for instance, I don't think there are witches. For instance. Mm -hmm. So what could we say on the basis of what you're saying here about how to be a realist, about how we can be non-realist about something which is, for instance, right. a witch? Um, thanks, Miklos. Um, so I, I think the answer is it's a, it's a two-step process, right? The, on, the, on the standard view where meaning sort of in some sense, depends on the thing in the world that, that's, that's purportedly picked up. We've got a bit of a problem understanding meaning. If I want to talk about, if I want to make a claim about witches, I can make a negative existential claim about witches precisely because I'm embedded in a community uh, that's sort of had sufficient, you know, sufficiently, you know, a sufficient amount of time to develop a practice according to which witch does stand in particular inferential relations to various other things, right? It stands in inferential relations to things like magic or maybe black cats or various sorts of things in such a way that even if 
each individual node is one that I don't, you know, I, I, for example, I, I might be unsure about what magic is, but then I can think about magic uh, in terms of what it rules out or in terms of what it supplements other kinds of claims about the world with, in such a way that um, the claim there are witches is perfectly intelligible, exactly like the claim that there are unicorns is perfectly intelligible. Um, and then I can just, uh, and then it turns into a sort of internal empirical claim, right? I know what I'm looking for, and I'm committed to the idea that there don't exist any witches because we've not found any witches, right? And then, and then the reason that you're committed to the to the non-existence, the reason that you're an anti-realist or a non-unrealist, um, will depend on further sort of argumentative moves that you make within that practice. But the practice is sufficiently rich to deliver you a negative existential claim, uh, and then it's just up to you to go into the world and sort of confirm that claim as it were, or, or you know, falsify that claim. Uh, Joanna, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the talk and for allowing me to ask a question. Um, at the beginning, you motivated your approach uh, by saying that we can't fix the reference of scientific terms by means of extension or something similar because we don't have perceptual access uh, to uh, those uh, entities to which these terms are supposed to refer. Um, and uh, I was wondering um, uh, what about uh, other options? For example, what um, uh, could, uh, mm, did you consider uh, um, uh, whether um, for example, descriptivist theory of such terms uh, could uh, do a similar job to uh, the theory that you have proposed, uh, uh, where we could say that, uh, for example, a fermion is whatever satisfies uh, such and such conditions given uh, by um, our current uh, theory of fermions. Great. Thank you so much, Yana. No, that, that's a really good question. I did think about descriptivism. The, the thing that I want to do is, so the, the, the story that I'm telling, the story that I want to tell is about sort of the totality of a kind of linguistic practice. And if, you've, if you want to tell a global descriptivist story, then, then you're going to run up against uh, sort of uh, Putnam's paradox type worries. So, um, so then you're going to have to plump for something like a local descriptivism. But then the question is, what is it that you know, the bits that you're not a local descriptivist about, in what sense are you, sort of how are you going to establish the reference, how are you going to establish reference for those in such a way that you can then tell a descriptivist story? And one suggestion is you could be an inferentialist about all of that and sort of ground your descriptivism in inferentialism. Um, I can't really, the, the, I don't know of any satisfying non-inferential alternatives to global descriptivism. Um, so basically, I mean, maybe this is just a failure of imagination on my part, but, but I think that, you know, I want to do away with what I was calling external referential crutches. And I feel like if you're not going to be a global descriptivist, you're going to have to have some kind of external referential crutches anyway. Um, and so I want, since I want to get rid of that, I can't, I can't really tell a global descriptivist story. I thought a little bit about this in the context of, um, sort of thinking about, um, you know, um, a, a kind of causal descriptivist story, sort of, you know, maybe a, um, a, a sort of Kripke or maybe a Silos type causal descriptivist story. But it runs up against exactly the same problems. Anytime you have this kind of descriptivism and you're not, and you, you either have the choice of local or global. Global is ruled out by Putnam and then local is uh, sort of relies on the referential crutches in this way. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but this is, this is the way that I'm, this is what's motivating me to just sort of put all of that to one side. Um, I hope, that, I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Yoni. Uh, great, Lizzie. You had a question earlier, didn't you? Yeah. Sorry, I think I dropped you from the list. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for the really illuminating talk. So uh, I, I like most of the things that you said, but uh, I, I just have this worry that the move that you're making, I wonder whether it can like, fully get rid of the, the word world coordinate uh, relation or mm -hmm. uh, the external referential crux price that you mentioned, because it seems to me that the inferential richness is in the sense that you are uh, embedding your, so, so the, the whole is of meaning, right? So you are embedding your uh, inferential uh, capacity into a larger like uh, network mm -hmm. of uh, uh, language practice or something. But 
it, but but then find uh do you still need something to uh latch on to the world so it the is does that finally uh grounded in some like uh, uh co common sense uh so is it so is, it, is the idea that you know, I'm talking about an, uh, um, an expressivism for a particular scientific practice, but scientists are also people who in, in, engage in sort of uh, linguistic practices that go well beyond that. And scientific practice is embedded in that kind of linguistic practice, or am I misunderstanding that? No, I mean, it seems that you sort of, uh, the, the move that you're making, my understanding, is, the, is sort, of re, uh, sort of delaying the, the word world relation to sort of embedding a larger uh, network. Oh, for, for example, when you talk about fermions, so, so there are things that you, uh, commitment you ascribe to this language practice yeah. about the talk of fermion. But in the, at the end of the day, if you want to be realist about uh, the world, there is some, you, you, you need to establish some kind of link yeah. with the world. Yeah. Right? yeah, that's right. So I think, so I think you're right. So, you know, you might think that you can sort of, at least for, for some practical purposes, sort of neatly circumscribe the, the, the sort of what you might call the physics linguistic practice, but really, sure, it's embedded in a broader practice. And then the question is, how does that broader practice kind of, how does the world impinge on that broader practice? And the answer is the world impinges in various ways by penalizing or, or sort of, what are, what are the opposites? Rewarding me for particular sorts of inferences, uh, particular sorts of conclusions rather that I come to as a result of uh, of the inferences that I make. Right. So I get the example, you know, the slightly contorted example of the sort of this is the same color as, and then I get penalized by by sort of someone rear-ending my car. There are various other things that I can, various other ways in which I can be penalized by the world. Right. I can be penalized by the world. Um, so for example, you know, I might I might I might make a claim like you know. Um, you know, I suddenly can't think of a false thing. Um, I might make a thing that all regions are bad, for example, right? Um, and that's perfectly meaningful. And I, I go out into the world and then I discover something that is such that the way that I talk about it, the, you know, the words that I use to describe it stand in the appropriate inferential relations that I know that I'm looking at a raven that's not black. And so the world is the world has sort of impinged on sort of my my linguistic practice web by being the way that it is by demonstrating that certain inferences that I took to be good were in fact not good inferences. And given that those the, given that those inferences were constitutive of some of the meanings of some of the terms, possibly all of the terms, I've now had to kind of recalibrate the way in which I think about the meanings of almost everything in my language, but certainly words like raven, bird, that sort of thing. So that's that's the sense in which the world kind of impinges on, on, the, on the linguistic practice. It, it, it happens at the level of, it happens at a sort of global holist level yeah well uh there's more time for the in in-house participants to chat over tea uh i think we can all agree that somebody who struggles to come up with the false claim <laughs> listening to <laughs> so thank you really to so much <laughs>